The history of Lyme disease is more than just a series of scientific milestones. It's a narrative that has profoundly shaped the way we understand, diagnose, and treat a complex and often contentious issue. As the clinician deeply immersed in the care of patients with Lyme disease, I find that tracing the history of this condition offers not just insights, but also a grounding in the realities of what we're up against. Lyme disease as we know it began in the mid-1970s in Lyme, Connecticut, when a group of children presented with unusual symptoms that were initially thought to be juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. The persistence and curiosity of researchers, notably Dr. Alan Steer, led to the identification of the disease and its association with tick bites. But it wasn't until 1981 when Dr. Willie Brigdorfer discovered the spirochete bacterium Brillia brigdorferi that the medical community had a clear target for diagnosis and treatment. The discovery of Brillia brigdorferi was a watershed moment, one that laid the foundation for the two-tiered serologic tests that became the standard for diagnosing Lyme disease. This test involved an initial ELISA, ELISA, followed by a confirmatory Western blot, was a significant advancement, yet it introduced a paradox that has haunted Lyme disease care ever since, the limitations of our diagnostic tools. The sensitivity of these tests, particularly in the early stages of infection, has always been a point of contention. It's a reminder that medicine, for all its advances, is still an evolving discipline often defined as much by its uncertainties as by its certainties. The understanding of Lyme disease quickly expanded beyond its initial clinical presentation of a characteristic rash, erythema migrans, and flu-like symptoms. We began to recognize that Lyme could manifest in myriad ways from neurologic complications like facial palsy and meningitis to cardiac issues such as Lyme carditis, which can cause heart block. These insights were crucial, but they also complicated the narrative. Lyme disease could no longer be neatly categorized. It was a shape shifter capable of mimicking of being mistaken for other conditions like multiple sclerosis, fibromyalgia, and even psychiatric disorders. Yet, as with many stories in medicine, the narrative of Lyme disease became fraught with controversy. The existence and treatment of chronic Lyme disease, or what some people call the syndrome, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, PTLDS, remains one of the most divisive issues in modern medicine. The question of whether persistent symptoms, chronic fatigue, joint pain, cognitive fog, brain fog, are due to lingering infection, an immune system gone awry, or something else entirely has split the medical community. On one side, there are those who argue that these symptoms are the result of persistent infection that requires long-term antibiotic treatment. On the other, there are those who believe that the symptoms represent a different process, possibly autoimmune or even psychosomatic. This debate is not just academic. It has real implications for patients and providers alike. For many patients, the experience of being told that their symptoms are not due to their ongoing infection but rather a result of some other poorly understood process can be invalidating, even traumatizing. The history of Lyme disease then is not just about scientific discovery, but also about the human experience of illness and a sometimes fraught relationship between patients and the medical establishment. The evolution of treatment strategies for Lyme disease reflects this complexity. Early on, short courses of antibiotics were the norm based on a belief that this would be sufficient to eradicate the infection. But as more was learned about the disease, and as the stories of persistent symptoms emerged, some clinicians began to advocate for longer and more aggressive treatment regimens. The discovery of co-infections like Babesia and Bartonella, which can be transmitted by the same ticks and complicated clinical picture, added yet another layer to the treatment puzzle. Public health policy and communication have also played crucial roles in the Lyme disease narrative. As the disease spread beyond the Northeast United States to other regions and even other continents, the need for public education and prevention strategies became clear. However, the messaging has not always been consistent or clear, leading to confusion and in some cases misinformation. 
this has been compounded by sensationalized media reports and the often polarized discourse within the medical community. For me, understanding the history of Lyme disease is essential to navigating this landscape. It provides context for the challenges my patients face and informs the way I approach their care. It reminds me that the controversies and debates are not just abstract arguments, but have real consequences for the people who walk through my door seeking relief from an illness that can be elusive as it is debilitating. By studying the history of Lyme disease, I'm reminded of the importance of humility in medicine. We don't have all the answers, and our understanding of this disease is still evolving, but this history also provides a foundation a set of lessons learned through trial and error, through persistence and curiosity, that I could build on to offer my patients the best possible care. It's a journey that continues, shaped by the past, but always looking toward the future, with the hope that one day we will have a more definitive answer for those who suffer from this enigmatic disease.